We have seven things that we prioritize when we play cello, and I always ask them, this is a little thought exercise in my scale book, I have this. Seven things that we think about when we play cello. And then we go through the thought exercise, and by the end, intonation doesn't rank anywhere near the top three. I have been you know, doing this for such a long time, I have a library of all this stuff. My students and my subscribers are like, well, I want the fingerings and I want the colors. I want, I want your system. Welcome to uh, another episode here, whether you're watching this on uh, Cello Online or watching it on uh, the Clay McKinney Musical Listening Channel. We're here with Jonathan Humphreys talking about listening and talking about cello stuff. So make sure we'll link everything up so you can catch, uh, catch all the parts of the interview here. Uh, but Jonathan, welcome. It's so uh, wonderful to have you here. We just so appreciate you uh, taking the time out to, to share your expertise and your years of you know experience here <laughs> with us. Well, uh, <laughs> expertise, I, I will have to say that. I, I, I'm an expert at one thing. I'm a pretty good expert at one thing. I'm, I'm pretty good at them. Um, I will tap myself on the back. But thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Clay. I appreciate it. Our instruments, with the f holes being, you know, down below and the sound is going away from us, you know, how do we listen to ourselves better? I mean, what do you say to students? You know, what do you say to them like, how do you how to help them make them more aware? How do we become more aware? Do you think of listening to ourselves while we are performing? Because you know that the first few times, because you know we of course you and I we record ourselves all the time now, and so we hear it. But there was a time when we would record ourselves and hear it and go, oh, <laughs> you know, we'd be like shocked. You know, I'm I I'm of the age. I I tell my students all the time. I like I had a you know a mini disc recorder. You know, I was in college and. Uh, you know, 1996, that was my second year uh, when I started actually cello studies. Um, and I tell them, I was like, God, you guys have these phones in your pockets. You can, um, you can, you know, record yourself all the time. You know, why are you not recording yourself? But there's always that shock of, oh, that's what it sounds like. And we, and we didn't know, we didn't know before. I don't know. I don't know what, it, what the explanation for that phenomenon is. What, it, how do you help them get over the, 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 the the listening gap there. Okay, I tell my ask my students, what do you hear? Do you hear yourself near your f holes? Are you hearing yourself near your fingerboard? Or are you hearing yourself in the back of the room? Are you playing for that person back there? Are not just the front row people play for the people in the back? Play for them, you know, and let that music call to them. And if you hit a wrong note, the play, get it out there, out there to them. And then if, when you stop thinking about the score, stop thinking about everything, and then you give it back to your audience, you break down that fourth wall. That's what I think when it comes to, we don't necessarily listen to ourselves as much as we are, because we are the music. And at that one point when you pl decide to play something, we all go in our like performance mode. Like, I want to play this, I want to play this. Like, oh, that note was wrong. I just played a wrong note right now. Huh, that happens. You know, I, I've played this one a thousand times. Probably you have too. But, you know, there's a possibility you might hit a right, right, note right or wrong. But does that, is how is your performance going? And always related to a meal. If you're, if you're enjoying a meal, maybe you sometimes will get a little chicken bone in your mouth and sometimes something will taste a little off. But then overall, how does it taste? How is the experience? How is the ambiance? Are you creating ambiance? This is why when I tell, tell my students is, what is the most important thing? We have seven things that we prioritize when we play cello. And I always ask them, this is a little thought exercise in my scale book, I have this. Seven things that we think about when we play cello. And so I'll list, I have them list their seven most important things you prioritize. A lot of them say intonation. A lot of them say, you know, a lot of them say intonation is number one. And then we go through the thought exercise and by the end, intonation doesn't rank anywhere near the top three. But universally, there are three things all cello players all the time will always, um, always prioritize, no matter what. 
And I go through the thought exercise with them. And when they realize, oh, that is, you know, that is, that, that's important. And you talked about, you know, again, listening. Today I was talking to a student and the student says to me, I did it so well in practice before I was in front of you. And I said, okay, hold. Just like you said, there are, there are plenty of um, recording devices out there. Record yourself. I throw down the gauntlet. Record yourself. And give me the recording, and then when we meet for next lesson, we'll listen to it together, but after you play it for me. And in the 25 plus years I've been teaching this instrument, I have yet to have a single person, I remember when they had little mini, mini like cassette recorder things, <laughs> and I would have my middle schoolers like record them. I did, Jonathan did so well, really? I always said, you really did, but what better? Record yourself. I even gave a kid one record with this Walkman thing. Record yourself. Comes back to me. I did better at, and like, and so he played it. His name was Jeremy. And then we were listened to ourselves and like, oh my God, that didn't sound good. I was like, there's a reason because when you are playing, practicing, you are in the moment. You are by definition subjective. You're not because you're part of the subject. When you are objective, you record yourself and then you listen to it, you cease to become the subject, you become the object. And when you're the object, you're the third person, you're able to see oh, all the frailties of the good and the bad. So your microphone isn't as nice as this beautiful microphone on my stand. Okay, but you can still have good tone, good ever, uh, you, can, you, can, you can hear, always you can hear through bad recording, bad mics, you can still hear the quality of the musician. But Again, all those little things like stridents and artifacts, those things will really come out on this player that's learning, especially when they cease to become subjective and start to be objective and realize, if you can sound good on an iPhone microphone, you're going to sound great on these large diaphragm uh, microphones. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I always, I always tell them, I, well, a couple of things. I, I always say to them, you know, when you're, when you get in front of your teacher, you get in this live situation where you have to play it, you know, adrenaline is the wonder drug. I always think there's a little bit of biology and chemistry involved where the adrenaline, you, I mean, you, just, you hear differently. You know, you're going to hear differently in a live situation where you're hyped up um, because that's what we're designed to do. <laughs> you know, when, when all that stuff starts happening and it's like, and and once you get in that that high pressure situation, you just become more critical. And I, I always try to encourage them. It's like if you can find a way to be that critical, like you said, and be objective, be the third party when you're on your own, then then yeah, then you'll you'll start to hear yourself differently when you're all by your all by your lonesome. You you mentioned something a couple of times, which is a cornerstone <clears throat> of what you know the 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 conversation, which is that this, this, this listening, this kind of functional part of what we do is simply too interconnected with the musical part or what we sometimes refer to, you know, we, 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 we've had a tendency over the, the decades, the centuries to separate technique from music. And, you know, I think, you know, yes, there, there are always fundamental things that you need to learn and you need to focus on, but when I hear you talk, I, I so agree with the fact that music is a fundamental. Like, you can't, in the end, you can't really separate it out. Like, it has to be a part of, you know, what we are doing. Like, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a separate thing. They're too interweaved together to make them separate. Do you ever... Do you ever have this conversation with students or like, how does it go? What, you know, when you're trying to like really con convince them that they're, that they're interlocked, right? Well, I guess you kind of already said it, like, you know, when you're in your performance mode, you're playing for other people, right? You know, yeah. um, that, that it's for, it's for someone else. Yeah. I so, I so very much agree with that. Uh, one um, thing I do with my students is um, I tell them that music is for, music is for reference, not for reading. And then sometimes I'm like, all right, it's enough. Turn, close your music, play it by memory. Or sometimes I'll start the lesson. I'm like, you should always pick up a cello and play uh, by memory. Now here in France, we don't say par mémoire. We don't say par mémoire. On the par cœur, which means by the heart. 
And if you think something that's by the heart is not by memory, memory is very analytical. I'm thinking, you know, reactions, techniques. But when we think by the heart, par coeur, means you not only do you know it, you feel it. You experience it emotionally in addition to physically as well. We're doing a physical action that requires an emotional component. That's what music is. We're just specialized athletes being all catching feelings about it at the same time. <laughs> That's what we basically are. You know, we're not the NFL player or the basketball player. We're them. But even in the context of watching teen sports or the Olympics or things, sometimes they see that and say, well, that's art because it's free flow and it flows so well. And it's just like, it's, it looks like art because it's so flowing. And in that moment, it is art. And we are doing the same thing, but in a very minute level, we don't, these are our players, this is our pitch and we're running around, but we're injecting a presence into every single motion. So the whole creation and the physical interaction of us in this box creates this thing where we sit down and we love and listen to called music that we can't touch, that we can't feel physically, that we can't smell, that we can't taste, but we experience and this experience as musician, music makers, and that's always say to my students is, you know, we go through four levels. As a student, the student discovers. And then when you are finished with your discovery, you become the technician. What does the technician do? The technician executes. And after you're done executing the technical stuff, you move on to the third level. And what is this? This is the player. And what does the player do? The player performs. And so you're in level three, and so you you get to the point where you're playing through the song, you're performing it, but you're not level four. You're not you haven't fully realized the, the the what it is. And the fourth level is a musician. And what does a musician do? A musician makes it makes in the moment. You sit there, you pay that money to sit this see this artist to see something created in front of you. They I want to be entertained. Entertain me. That's when I, when I sit down, people want to, you want to entertain me? Put, pick up something, bang on a, bang on a, on, on a pat, on a pan. You're creating for me. Create for me. I'm all about that. I'm just like, I love when people just, when you don't realize something's going to happen, the street buskers and they, they create something and you're like, I always give money to street buskers. You have a scale book that you published yeah. recently and you have yeah. actually many scores for sale um, on your website, but yeah, first, I mean. T tell us about the scale book and then maybe tell us some about the, the scores. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I guess I'll pull that up real quick. Um, my scale book. My scale book. Why, why make a scale book, you know? Why, like, why, why should anyone make a scale book? There's, there are already scale books out there. Why should, why, why, why should you make a scale book? Like, it's, the, it exists already. It exists there. There's plenty. You can get it for free. Why should you go and pay for one? You know? Well, because I have developed this over 15 years. And everything that the way it's taught is in two languages. And the order by which it's taught. And as you see, you're here in E-flat major. And then right into octave on a string. Now, this is something that I came up with. And it doesn't need to be comprehensive it needs to be essential and then you're already shifting and then boom you're into the four class i use this funky clef people freak out about that lose their marbles one octave arpeggios and it's all very systematic going things because i want to play songs in minor you know there's a song that everybody well that's d minor re mineur you know so they need to learn these things, and so I use these reference. Well, what what is a key signature? You got to know some reading of music, and so I come up with the scale book um, based upon the years of, of practice, uh, years of teaching, and the order by which I teach it. And like for instance, the, the natural minor is super is something really um, uh, important for me because people think that the minor is the melodic minor, and it's no, the Ray sixth and seventh. Minor is first you have to know the natural mode before you know the harmonic and melodic mode. So how do you know what you're modifying if you don't know the original form of it, which is the natural form? So I came up with this and it uses something that um, I've developed over the years and it's my color coded bracket system. And so it's in color and it's gone through many iterations. I started making them in 2010 
And it has all the little things like, you know, this thing right here, the one fingering to rule them all. A lot of little, little fun things in here. And I'll go to the back. I'm really proud of that. You know, there's little lectures and so there's a lecture right there, some ear training stuff. And, and it, and it's, um, it gets, uh, now we get to the more heavy stuff. There's third octave and the third octave melodic minor and thumb position, which I'm actually having fun doing with one of my students getting her to do thumb position arpeggios, major thirds, and then get to the vocabulary. Cause again, they, they don't know, there's so many resources out there. I distill it into one resource, some simple, and of course in two languages, cause to teach in two languages. And then right here is a scorecard. A lot of students wanted to know like, all oh, right, where, where do I stand? How good am I? Here's your scorecard. Can you play these, um, these, these, uh, these scales? Can you play a C major scale? And you use this complicated system of smileys and then you, you fill in the blanks. And so when you see a new, see an, uh, a new song, like, all right, this song is an F major. You go to your scorecard. Can you play, let's say F major. Can you play a two octave F major scale? Well, there's nothing there. And I can, you know, objectively say to a student whether, and this is the whole scale book. If you fill in all of the white blocks, you have, you know, you've mastered the scale book. And this right here is one very particular thing that I believe I'm the only student and only teacher in the world doing this. And I had a vision back in 2011, a vision of no paper, that the future involves no paper. And if movies, if, I don't, we're too young for this, when movies came out, they're all black and white. And then color came in and people said, well, that's going to take away from the drama, from the, from, the, from the gravity of the scene. Black and white movies are more dramatic. And we see them now as something that is used for effect. But come on, the color movie is like, color is like how we see. So I devised this color coded bracket system to show the positions, you know, you know in the music. And so, um, because again, we see in color. And so all of my uh, different, like uh, different parts right here, I'm gonna use like this right here. Here's a good example. So you'll see my colors all there. And yes, there's a presumption that you as a student are going to either be printing in color or using a tablet. And I honestly believe that the future is a paperless future. And when I got my iPad in 2011, I stopped using paper and I haven't used the paper ever since. So, so the idea of writing things down or pencil and paper and erasing, that's, that's ancient. That's, that's last century, last millennia. hundred years from now, we're not going to be reading off paper. 200 years from now, we're going to be, everything's going to be digital. We see in color, so we should learn in color. There's your half position, lower second position. And it, and it doesn't interfere with your understanding of the music. It's outside of the fingerings, outside of the bowings. You know, it's there. And a lot of my students like, I need the colors. And they love the colors. And it really helps them distill like what is happening with the music. And it, you know that this right here is a shift. Without the bracket, you, you would say, okay, what is that? But with the bracket, you can refer to that. A lot of my students refer to like, hey, that is upper second position. And the colors that I use, going back to my wonderful uh, thing here, because I really like it, by the way. I, I love my, yeah, well, I even have a distilled version. Here it is. And these particular colors, I'm proud to say that I had a student that was very colorblind. And we went through and found all the shades that he, he could do. He saw shades of brown and that was it. So these are all ones he could differentiate from each other. So these are, and so he was, that's why they're kind of off. They're not really green, strong greens, strong blues. They're all little separate colors and you have the hex codes next to them. So you can match it up on your printer and on your computer. So you can have exactly the color that, that appears here. And it works. A lot of people like, you know, uh, and on my website, it's the same thing. So I started to, I, you know, again, in 2011, I was, um, let me bring up, I hope they fixed my website. <laughs> okay, they did. Um, in 2011, I was like, I started building this ecosystem. It's like, not only am I, tr am I um, making all my scores on, um, in PDF format, I don't believe in paper anymore. So when I have a lesson, I, I make it notations and I email it to you and you have a new version of the, of the score. But also... I have been, you know, doing this for such a long time. I have a library of all this stuff. My students and my subscribers are like, well, I want the fingerings and I want the colors. I want, I want your system, you know? And so I've been building this ecosystem of, you know, 
of pedagogy and of scores and of teaching videos. And so they all kind of come together. And yeah, on my website here, you can get some of the scores if you so wish, and which is great if you so wish, but not necessarily. But here's the latest one. I'm very proud of this, the Sugar Plum Fairy. And once again, you see, you know, here the, um, my, there's my fourth position right here. And, and this was a request from a student to play the Sugar Plum Fairy. And again, it's a lot of work that I put in and people actually support it a little bit. So yeah, if you want to buy any of my scores, go to cellocoach.com. I am the cello coach. And there's some people trying to copy. <laughs> some people try to copy it, oh, but uh, <laughs> I know it's all good. I'm, I don't have the you know, trademark yet, but um, you know, when you think of cello coach, I'm kind of the guy. I don't you call are. myself a cello professor or cello guru or anything. I'm a cello coach. That's why I wear like sporty outfits. I'm going to go in and sweat with you and do it with you. And, you know, coaches aren't, you know, masters. Coaches are people that did the sport that are passionate about making their team, their, their athletes as good, even better than them and pushing them to the next level. That's what coaches do. So uh, that's what I do. I'm a tele coach. Well, you've, you've certainly blazed the trail for the rest of us, and we, we greatly appreciate it because you've been doing this for, for such a long time and just so appreciate you. And we will link all this up. You can go, to, you can go straight there, cellocoach.com, and we'll get you there to the website for the scale book and all the scores, but we'll also link it up specifically down uh, in the description here of the video so you can find, find and connect with Jonathan there. There was one other thing you said a second ago that is also... Uh, uh, a cornerstone of something that I've written um, in some blog posts there, um, but I don't think I don't think I've ever actually asked it. So I'm glad you brought it up. You were talking about we were, we were talking about playing for somebody else, and you know the sound being out there, and and we've mentioned this before. You know, play to the back row. How much do you think? And let me let me preface this. I am not a I am not a neuroscientist. Neither is Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> we're just we're just curious cellists with lots of experience but is that is that whole spatial relation thing real is there like some real like uh biological thing going on there where we're thinking about the space around us i also ask it because you know one of my one of my aunts was a elementary music teacher and one of her things she would do to help me sing and to help her students sing and she would she would tell them you know literally put the note right here in front of you, you know, and you kind of said the same thing. Like, what do you think is going on there? This, this whole thing of like, put the sound out there and it, it really does help. I mean, why do you think it helps? I think there, I think it's our awareness, our presence of mind. When I talk about the bow, it's the same thing. I don't talk about pressure. I don't talk about weight. I talk about presence, presence of the bow. Where are you present along your bow? You're not pushing down. You are, where are you present? Are you present? Are you aware of this? And when it comes to this, I guess, this understanding of, um, of putting your note out there, I like how you said that. Um, I call myself the cello coach for a reason because I relate it to a lot to sports because we are you know, uh, athletes. When you have, I'm going to take the quarterback, for example, and they throw that ball and they throw that ball 40, 30 yards. And where are they thinking? They're thinking here. Are they thinking the arc? Or do they think, are they out there? Where, are they, where is Peyton Manning or, you know, the, or any of the famous uh, guys, Brett Favre, whatever. I'm aging myself. The, the new guy uh, for the Chiefs. Don't know his name. It's all right. I got a couple of years on you, I think, Jonathan. You're, you're <laughs> right there together. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, who's the guy for the Patriots? Anyway, the guy for the Patriots. That was like... Really good. really good. Forget his name. Forget his name. I know he's like the most famous one. I can't think of his name either. <laughs> his face. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so quarterbacks aren't like thinking about you know the, the here or the trajectory. They're they're like they're right there, and they whoop like a golfer. A golfer aims out there, and so if we can aim the ball out there and get it in the hands of our wide receiver, get into that that. You know, get into the green area to, to make par or in to uh, under par. If we can do that, that's where presence is. Then our notes need to do the same thing on a much smaller scale. We're not shooting out there, but when you are in a bigger, smaller room, you know, I don't like to say play to the back row because that's presuming that first there are rows, and secondly, um, I like to say kind of like permeate. 
permeate the crowd. Play in a way that is so that arrests the attention of everyone around you. And the best thing is when you play in a noisy bar, you probably have done this, play it in a noisy bar. People are drinking, they're just having a good time. And you start playing cello. And when that ripples out and you get people and people don't go, Shh, they just like have to stop. Like, wait a minute, that sounds, uh, uh, whatever that is, that's it's good. And for a moment, you may get two, three seconds from that noisy couple on the end of the bar. But when you do, and you get that oh, little bit of quietness and they go back to talking and cussing each other out. That is to me, that's magic. Cause then everybody's sort of like itching to have a little bit of like uh, a little respite from, from thinking and music gives us that uh, ability and as musicians and as music teachers, we are transferring this knowledge to our students, to everyone else to like, Hey, we're giving you the, I call it the dragon's breath. So then you can take and breathe this magic out of your instrument and onto people. And regardless if they like it or not, you want to arrest them. You want to stop them. Even if they stop for 10 seconds or two seconds, you have made an impression on them. They stop and that's not in tune. They listen to you as if they walk by, and don't do anything. That's the worst. If they stop. Oh, wow. That's great. Okay. You impress them. Stop. Oh, that's not good. Hey, they still listen to you. So, especially with the social media, they stop. Oh, I don't like that. Well, they listened to it and left a comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we know about the trolls, don't we? <laughs> oh, do we ever know about the trolls? <laughs> do we ever know about the trolls? Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for sharing this uh, with us and uh, make sure you uh, check out the links in the description there if you want to find Jonathan here online cellocoach.com we'll put links to all that including the the scale books and his scores anything else for the cello online audience here um, enough talk parting words parting words of wisdom parting words of wisdom remember it will never be good enough but is it good enough for you beautiful you know the thank you and thank you and, uh, and, uh, and thank you thank you for having me and everybody watching this you know cello is a beautiful wonderful thing keep it up it's frustrating but uh, it's it's you will get you will get there you will get there one day and when you do it's so rewarding be sure and check out part two of this interview right here on the channel and if you're in the mood for something else, YouTube thinks you'll like this video right here.